are tuned in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, guiding your gridiron journey, none other than your host, former NFL lineman, Ross Tucker. Oh, oh, oh yeah, it is. But it, just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast, it is a Monster Monday presented, of course, by DraftKings. Love those dudes. Love those of you that use the code Ross over at DraftKings Sportsbook. By the way, speaking of love, how about me moving Greg Cosell up to a Monday this week. I couldn't do it. I couldn't wait till Thursday to talk to Greg about some of the things that went down in the draft. I had to talk to him. I'm not waiting four more days or whatever that is. So we've got the civilian goat from NFL Films, Greg Cosell, joining us momentarily. It is a new week, which means we should have new winners in terms of those of you that Rate and review the show. What an easy way to get a signed press pass for me. Rate and review the show and forward it to me. Ross at RossTucker.com. Spread the word via social media. At Ross Tucker NFL. At Ross Tucker Pod. We're looking for a few good quote posters. Sponsor confirmation email winner. Always amazing. You take advantage of any of these deals we have for you. At Game Time or Good Ranchers or DraftKings or whatever. And then the YouTube shout out. Love how the YouTube just keeps going up every week. YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. There's a lot to get into. Let's start it up. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. Okay, Greg, several first round selections I'm curious to get your opinion on, but because it just happened, we don't often have Monday morning while we're recording breaking news, but the Dallas Cowboys just signed Zeke Elliott back after a year in New England. Right now, their backfield is Zeke Elliott, Rico Daldell, um, Deuce Vaughn. It appears as if Zeke would be their starting running back. What did you see from him last year in New England? What does he still have left? Yeah, I don't think he's good enough to be a starting running back, quite frankly, based on what I saw last year. And you could argue even what you saw at his final year in Dallas. Um, you do look at their depth chart, and that's a pretty significant concern going into the season. Uh, again, there's time between now, training camp, and the season. So we don't want to say, hey, nothing can happen. But I, I can't imagine. I just can't imagine that they would go into the season with the idea that Zeke Elliott is their number one running back and is going to get a significant number of carries as their primary back. Yeah, well, I mean, I I guess they could make a trade at some point, Greg, or maybe hope that they can get somebody off of a team's practice squad, you know, based on who looks good in the preseason. I I don't know. know. I I don't know the answer to that, Ross, but yeah, the bottom line is, look, you know what I do. I think people who listen know what I do. And I'm just making a comment based purely on tape and based on tape. This is a team that's going that needs to run the football. Um, Dak Prescott had a really good year last year, but you can argue that Dak is is, uh, essentially, he's an efficient executor. He's a ball distributor. They need a run game. And I don't see uh, Zeke Elliott being the kind of back at this point in his career that can effectively carry the ball 220, 230 times. Right. I I would agree. And I don't know if it's just uh, gives them a floor or if it's name recognition or or what's going on. I mean, they don't have anybody else. I I guess they felt like they had to get somebody. They waited until after the draft. I think they wanted to try to draft somebody, but it didn't unfold that way for them for whatever reason. The draft did unfold in several interesting ways. Now, I think next week, Greg, I want to get into some of your favorite picks and some of the the more interesting picks. But today I'm being selfish. Today's (laughs) uh, about the the questions I have, not necessarily some of the guys that jumped out to you. I want to start with the Falcons selection of Michael Penix Jr. Now, if you want to comment on the process, Greg, By all means, go for it, you know, but I know that you a lot of times you're just talking about the players. If you want to talk about the Falcons process, your thoughts on them taking Penix, I'd love to hear it. But at a minimum, refresh my memory and everybody else's memory on what you thought of Penix as a player, because obviously the Falcons really, really liked him to do what they did. 
Yeah, word on the street is he was their second-rated quarterback in the draft and their fourth-best overall player. That's the word on the street. Uh, people can agree or disagree with that, but that's what the Falcons had on their draft board. Um, I, I liked Michael Penix's tape. I watched him last summer from 2022, this year from 2023. Um, he was the best intermediate and deep ball thrower in this draft class. They had an offense under Ryan Grubb, who's now the O.C., in Seattle that did attack at the intermediate and vertical areas, which you don't see that much in college football. And Penix made those throws. And Penix was willing to make those throws. And I thought one of the most interesting things about Penix, Ross, was it was a downfield passing game, and he rarely ever got sacked, which means he was getting rid of the football, which means he was accountable to the system. He understood where to throw the ball within the timing and structure of the offense. So I liked Penix as a prospect. You know me, I don't get into doing draft boards or making lists. Uh, but, you know, that's where they had him. And if, if that's the way you had him evaluated, you know, again, now you get into the argument that, well, they needed help here, they needed help there, and, and they have Kirk Cousins. I, I let others make those, you know, make those points. I'm not a believer either. And while they could have gotten him later, you have no idea what what they could have got. You have no idea who Kevin O'Connell liked. You know, maybe he loved Michael Penix. You, you don't know any of this stuff. Nobody does. The only thing that people do is they make these comments based on their evaluation. And that's all we can do. So the, the one follow-up question there is, if he's the best intermediate and deep ball thrower in the draft, why was he the fourth guy to go off the board? I mean, is, does he struggle on the underneath stuff? I mean, I, I would think if you're the best intermediate and deep thrower in the draft, you wouldn't be the fourth guy off the board. Well, what do you mean the fourth guy off the board? Fourth quarterback that got taken. Oh, oh. Well, people evaluate quarterbacks differently, Ross. I can't speak for other people's evaluation. I'm just telling you what I saw on tape, and I watched probably 15, 16 games over the course of the last two years. I can't speak for others. Um, and then it depends on, on other factors that teams do due diligence about, which I don't do. Number one, I don't interview him, although I did meet Michael Penix, and he's a phenomenal kid. Um, maybe the injury history is a factor. Maybe the age is a factor. Uh, there could be other things that play into an evaluation. There are other things that play into an evaluation. Um, I'm just telling you what I saw on tape, and I like him as a prospect. Um, you know, that's obviously they did too, because like I said, word on the street was that he was their second rated quarterback and their fourth best player in the entire draft. While we're talking quarterbacks, Greg, I, I did want to, um, I think I remember what you said about these guys, but let's talk Drake May and JJ McCarthy. How would you, because I know how you felt about Caleb Williams. I know you felt about Jaden Daniels. How would you compare those two guys, Drake May yeah. And J.J. McCarthy, because it felt like, you know, all the reports were is that those were the two guys the Patriots were seriously considering. Yeah, and, and let's remember one thing. No quarterback comes into the NFL as a finished product, so people can't look at these guys as if, uh, wow, you know, this guy, how could they draft a guy there? He's got some problems. They all do when they come into the league. May was probably the toolsiest of all the quarterbacks in this draft. 6'4", 225, big arm, another guy that threw down the field extremely well. Um, missed too many easy ones. That was a big concern with Drake May. Missed too many routine layup throws with poor ball location. Um, had a tendency to drift in the pocket, created his own pressure. That's clearly coachable and fixable. Uh, the main question will be his ball location. Can that be fixed, particularly on throws 12 yards and underneath, um, where he just missed too many? Um, McCarthy, I viewed more as a developmental project. Um, he played uh, arguably for the best team, not arguably, the best team in the country behind the best offensive line in the country, was rarely under duress, um, made a lot of uh, throws where he worked hard to throw the ball. That's something that I learned years ago, and that just struck me about McCarthy. He worked hard to throw the ball. Um, so I, I, I viewed McCarthy as someone who needs a scheme and a system and a run game, and that all may play out beautifully. He's in Minnesota. Um, maybe in three years we'll be talking about McCarthy as a really good player, but I saw him much more as a guy that's going to need some time to develop, to be taught, before he could be a quality starter in the NFL. Interesting. Um, when you say worked hard to throw the ball, Greg, talk about that a little bit more, please, so that 
you know, the listeners know what you mean. What do you mean he worked hard to throw the ball? Um, it required a lot of effort for him to make throws that were relatively routine. In other words, let's say you're talking about a dig ball at 17, 18 yards. And by the way, he had so many clean pockets. Is he literally would hitch up two, three times, and that's not nothing is taught that way on a dig ball and really work. You could see his whole body getting involved in delivering the football. He needed a firm base to throw the ball. He needed everything to be right to deliver the football, and he had to work to throw it, and that really stood out on tape. Um, I know that a lot of people have said with his pro day and things that happened since the season that he's got a big arm. He did not show that on tape. Um, and that's all I have. I'm not at a pro day. I'm not doing private workouts. I can, I'm only seeing the tape from the season. Maybe he's improved. Maybe there was a work on mechanics, um, which he needed, by the way. Maybe all these things have improved since the season. But watching his college tape, because obviously he has not played a game since the national championship game. That's what I'm watching. And he was, to me, much more of a developmental guy based on tape. Interesting. Really good stuff, Greg. As always, absolutely love it. Just like I absolutely love Labatt Blue Light. It's delicious. I took it to the next level a bunch this weekend. Uh, man, concerts, draft, everything. Drinking Labatt Blue Light with my friends, living life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly beer. Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. Okay, Greg. I've got some non-quarterback questions for you as well. One of the big surprises to me of the draft was that at 22, the Philadelphia Eagles had their choice of the top corners. I don't think anyone thought that the draft would unfold that way. So I sort of asked you already to compare and contrast Drake May and J.J. McCarthy. Can you compare and contrast Quinion Mitchell and Terry on Arnold, the top two corners that the Eagles had had their choice of, because obviously people will be talking about the, those two players and comparing them for years now, knowing that the Eagles had their choice of those guys. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of it, too, comes down to what you like better in terms of your critical factors. Mitchell is a bigger corner. He looks bigger. He's almost built like a running back. Arnold is smaller. He's not small, but he's smaller. Um, so Mitchell, by the way, he hardly ever played press coverage in college at Toledo. Now, again, I read at the senior ball, he lined up and played press a lot, and people were very impressed with his ability to do that. That was not on the tape. But Mitchell is a bigger, more purely explosive athlete. And I think that you're looking at a kid that you probably feel is an ascending player in terms of what he can be taught. Um, he was unbelievable at Toledo with plant and drive from playing off coverage. He was explosive, that plant and drive, click and close, whatever term people want to use. When you're playing off and you react to a route in front of you and you attack both the receiver and the ball, he was outstanding at the catch point, not in terms of making interceptions, but in terms of getting his, hand, his, getting his hands in and knocking the ball away. So you're dealing with a bigger, more explosive athlete. Um, he ran a 4-3-3 at a, as a bigger man than Arnold running a 4-5-1. And by the way, 40 times, as you know, Ross, do mean something when it comes to corners. So the Eagles took the player that probably has better overall physical and athletic traits. Now, we don't know what that means down the road. No one does. It, it, we're talking the Monday after the draft. But that's my guess is that's why they took Mitchell. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially if they're both really good players and you're debating between the two. I, I think one thing you said that was interesting there, Greg, too, is I understand the whole big school, small school and, you know, the level of competition. But there's also something to be said for, you know, Quinion Mitchell was not coached by Nick Saban. Right. So maybe there's more maybe there's yeah. even more there. And certainly knowing the Eagles and, and their desire for traits, they can get a bigger, fast. If it's between two guys and the one guy is clearly bigger and faster, they're probably going to take that guy. Normally teams do that unless, you know, unless the other guy is just so, so good. And I like Arnold. You could make the easy argument they were the two best corner prospects in the draft and the draft played out that way. Um, but you're dealing with one guy that's just a bigger, more physical, better athlete. And the Eagles took that guy. So I think we talked about these guys, Greg, when we did the wide receivers. 
But I just, since they went in the first round and they went ahead of guys like Keon Coleman and uh, A.D. Mitchell, as well as Ladd McConkey, I wanted to hear what you had to say again about Ricky Pearsall, who went to the Niners, and Xavier Leggett, who went to the Carolina Panthers. Because it's really interesting. You know, C.J. Stroud and Brandon Ayuk, Ricky Pearsall was like, Clearly a favorite of of players that had seen him play. He he must be pretty good. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, as you know, I do other radio shows, uh, uh, you know, in various cities. And last week I did San Francisco before the draft. And they asked me about receivers because, you know, the thought was they might trade Ayuk. Even Samuel's been talked about. And they asked me what receiver I thought, you know, if they were to pick a receiver early uh, that I thought would fit what they do. And I said, Ricky Pearsall. And so it turned out, yeah, I, you know, I was right because they drafted Ricky Pearsall. So they, they obviously saw it the same way I did. And, you know, they're probably a little smarter than I am in, in making those evaluations. But Pearsall was one of my favorite receivers the more and the deeper I got into his evaluation. Um, I thought he was one of the better route runners I saw on tape. I thought he had a pretty refined understanding of how to use his vertical stem to attack and break down DBs. He had body feints. He had head movements. Um, he gave his quarterback indicators. You talk to any quarterback or receivers coach, and they'll tell you that they need indicators, whether it's a head feint, whether it's sticking with your inside or outside foot. They need an indicator from a receiver as to when they can then deliver the football. Um, so he was pretty detailed and nuanced. He separated. Um, he has great hands. Everybody has seen some of his great catches. I really liked Ricky Pierce, so I had no idea, of course, where he would get drafted. And I think one thing, and again, teams look at this because I have conversations with coaches, his 20-yard shuttle time was off the charts, and he's not a small little guy. I mean, you're talking about a guy that is 6'1", so he's not a little guy. And his 20-yard shuttle was that of a much smaller man. So, Ricky Pearsall, I think for the Niners and how they run their offense is a really good pick. So funny, too, Greg, because it's like, I know they don't hit on every pick, right? They, they obviously Nobody don't. Nobody does. But yeah. it's almost like if the Niners think enough of him to take him in the first round at receiver, he's probably pretty good. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, the way – and you can just picture him – and Kyle Shanahan's offense. It's almost like when the Rams took Puka Nakua last year. Like, those, like there's certain coaches that, man, they get a pretty good track record of at certain positions of knowing guys that can can come in and have success yeah, in their and offense. Don't forget, Russ. A number of years ago, they traded up to take Brandon Ayuk, and that's worked out okay. Absolutely. What about? I don't even know if we did talk about Xavier Leggett. I don't think we, we did a wide receiver episode. I, I, maybe we did. I don't remember. What yeah, he is a him? big, big dude now, but he runs exceptionally well. I mean, um, I would say that he needs some work as a route runner. He's a little straight line stiff just because of how much he weighs. I spoke to one coach that said he should probably lose 10 pounds because he's 221. He'd still be big at 210. But, um, you know, there some people look at him, and I can understand this and see a DK Metcalf type receiver. He's not as quite as big as Metcalf, obviously, who's six four two thirty, but he's built like that. He's got that kind of body, but he's more stiff than loose. Um, but he really is an explosive, explosive athlete. Um, I mean, his size, his speed. Um, He's really, he's a guy that I think a lot of people feel will be an ascending player once he gets to the league and once he's, you know, works with a, a wide receivers coach and is taught more of the nuances and the details of the position. But you get the ball in this guy's hands on, on slants, glances, crossers, those kinds of routes. And he is a, he's an explosive athlete who's difficult to tackle. Um, he's, I don't want to say he's Debo Samuel, but you sort of see that physical and competitive component to his game with the ball in his hands. You know, one more receiver I wanted to get your opinion on, Greg, is Xavier Worthy. Because a lot was made of the Bills trading down and the Chiefs trading up to get Xavier yeah. Worthy. We all know about the 40 time. What is, is, he, is he as a player? Is he a one-trick pony, Greg, or is he more than that? No, I think he's a little more than that. I think there's a toughness to him that, uh, you know, you don't really acknowledge a lot because he's 165. But I think that he's a tough kid, um, you know. And I think where he went to the Chiefs is a really good spot for him for this reason. Um, 
we see receivers now, Ross, that weigh less. And because teams use motion, and the Chiefs are among the league leaders in their deployment of motion. So what happens now? Motion gives you free access off the ball. Very difficult to press receivers when they're in motion. So it's an offense that fits what he is exceptionally well with that use of motion. Get him off the ball so he can scream off the ball and accelerate. Because obviously, we didn't need to know... We didn't need to see a 4 2 one time to know he's fast. I watched the tape for the last two years. He could have run a 4 2 and he still would have been fast. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think there's more to him than just a vertical dimension. Check him out on social media. He is the man at Greg Cosell, of course. Next week, Greg, I know there's some other picks that really got your attention. I want to dive into uh, Greg's guys next yeah. week. That will be our episode which will be awesome. I'm already looking forward to that. Thank you so much for coming on a Monday. Just could not wait till Thursday. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ross. Loved it. Man, Greg is good. You know what's not good? Your favorite cut of beef or chicken costing more and weighing less every time you buy it. Well, I've got a sizzling solution for you. It's the Good Ranchers price lock guarantee. The only price lock on 100% American meat you can find You do not want to miss it. It's the April Price Shield campaign. Good Ranchers is locking in your price until 2026 when you subscribe to any one of their boxes full of 100% American meat and seafood that they ship right to your door. Get your meat where I get my meat. Good Ranchers. Use my code ROSS at GoodRanchers.com today. You get an extra 10% off. So think about that. Love the commitment to transparency. Love knowing what's in the food. And love meat and love the discount code. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use my code Ross for 10% off your subscription and a price lock guarantee until 2026. GoodRanchers.com. American meat delivered. Tuck Steaks. All right, Ross, speaking of sizzling solutions, the Cowboys, they agreed to terms with their former running back, Ezekiel Elliott. I don't really have much to say about that other than what Greg already said. I mean, the fact that they waited till after the draft tells you that they wanted to draft a guy, but it didn't happen. You know, this has got has to be an incredibly frustrating offseason for Cowboys fans where you feel like the team hasn't really done anything to get better or move the needle or improve from last year. And yet, you know, the, the owner's talking about being all in. It, that, that is frustrating. So this happened way back on Wednesday, but we didn't get to talk about it on Friday. Wide receiver Amon Ross St. Brown gets a four-year, $120 million extension, $77 million of that guaranteed. While offensive lineman Penny Sewell gets four years, $120 million with the, or $112 million with the Lions. So I believe that they both became the highest paid players at their position in the league. And, you know, it's funny, the timing. I'm sure the Lions had this in the works for weeks, but they wanted the momentum and the excitement of the day before the draft, which is in Detroit, which, by the way, looked like it was absolutely electric the entire weekend. I loved it. But this is sort of the Eagles model, right? Like, you know you've got first-team all-pro players that you want around for the long haul, the sooner you get them agreed to and signed, the better, because it's only going to go up. Texan wide receiver Tank Dell was shot as an innocent bystander in a nightclub shooting, but he was already released from the hospital, and he's expected to be fine. Well, thank goodness. I I guess he was not even involved in the altercation, but the the shooting happened, and he had to go to the hospital. It's just... Should not be the way it is. Thank goodness he's okay. But stuff like this just should not happen. And the Eagles, they signed former Jets first-round pick offensive tackle Mekhi Becton. So a bunch of things that are really cool about this, right? Number one, as of today, if you sign someone today, which is when the Eagles are signing him, it doesn't count against the compensatory picks, right? So the Eagles waited to sign him until today for a reason. Secondly... If anybody can get something out of Mekhi Becton, it's Eagles offensive line coach Jeff Stoutland because he's that good. And there was so much talk 
about the Eagles getting a, a an heir apparent, right, a tackle of the future for Lane Johnson. I think they thought, well, let's see what we can do with Mekhi Becton. Maybe he can be that guy at some point. It's uh, it's just very, very smart. Sounds like he'll be their swing tackle. You got to love it if you're an Eagles fan. I think we're done here. Thanks for tuning in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also check out Even Money, Fantasy Feast, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network on Samsung TV+, Plus, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. Shout out MyFrontPageStory.com. Less than two weeks away, make sure you get the best Mother's Day gift for a loved one you could ever get. MyFrontPageStory.com myfrontpagestory.com, lovebackofficescheduler.com, steakhousesports.com, humanheadnyc.com, sportaculture, and pizza boy brewing.